Namaste. Namaste, dear friends. Uh, namaste, Dr. Kausto Bezikachar. Uh, I'm today's host, Katya Ucic. Uh, I am a yoga teacher. I am a yoga therapist. I am also a coach and an art therapist. And uh, today I am in my, uh, as your host and host for, for Dr. Kausu Desi Kachar, I am uh, uh, someone who is ac actually asking uh, quite intense and provocative uh, questions. Uh, how are you, Dr. Kausu Desi Kachar, calling to India, to Chennai? Namaste, Katya. <clears throat> Thank you for organizing this once again. Um, we are uh, safe in India so far. Um, there is a lockdown for the last uh, 10 days now, since the 22nd of uh, March. So we are all at home, and uh, but we are safe. We are happy to have a roof above our head. It's a privilege. And I'm using this time a lot, very usefully, to translate some of my father's works and review my own studies with him so <clears throat> that my mind is not captured by the negativity of the media, but actually <clears throat> is utilizing this time for positive purposes. And I'm also very grateful because I've been somebody who has traveled so much for the last uh, 15, 20 years with no break. Somehow this is like a forced break. So my body is very grateful, even though there are other challenges, my, at least my body is very grateful. This is a very good point that we can rest and reflect. And um, this time on your second interview, uh, somehow we decided to talk about death and dying. But uh, before we start this very, oh, Kausu is smiling. <laughs> it's your choice. It's not my choice. You chose the topic. That's yes, why. I I got, I got an insight. Uh, I was waiting for an insight about the second interview, and it was very clear for me. Uh, I will explain also a little bit further how it happened. Um, and this is also all the question that started to come to me. But I think Kaustup, you as a yoga teacher, as a yoga therapist, as a healer, and as a spiritual advisor, mentor for mentor for all the people around the world, you have many, many clients, many students that we are in your program and you help a lot of people on spiritual level that you are the one who should actually uh, answer all these questions. Uh, so um, um, why actually I, I, I was thinking to, to have this topic is first it's um, everything around us. Yeah, it's the panic, it's the fear. But if we die a little bit more, uh, uh, even deeper into our subconscious, we can detect the ancient fear that, that lies there is the fear of dying. And then I was reflecting, dying and death. What is death? Who is actually death? Yeah? And then I was reflecting, how is our relationship to death? Because this is such an important, maybe the most important event in our life, let's say, and we don't know anything about it. And we are scared yeah, uh, to, for ourselves and for other people also go to go to work. So um, this is uh, somehow the, the, um, the current situation around the world because of the uh, coronavirus. And also because, you know, I, I, uh, I'm really a deep thinker somehow. It, it is in my blood. And all these things are very, very uh, uh, interested, uh, interesting for me. Uh, so I found it very important and beneficial to all of us to speak about this. Uh, if you can add something to this, would be very nice. But then I think we should start with a small chant that you are always uh, providing for us and chant for us to connect as a group. <clears throat> Om Atha Purusho Havainarayano Akamayat 
प्रजाश्रजेता प्रजाश्रजे ये नारायण प्राणो जायते मन सर्वेन्द्रिया खम वायुज्योतिराप पृथ्वी विश्व धारिणी नारायण ब्रह्मा जायते नारायण रुद्रो जायते नारायण इंद्रो जायते नारायण प्रजापत प्रजाते नारायण द्वादशादिद्रवसवसर्वाणि छंदागुंसे नारायण देव समुत्पद्यंते नारायणे प्रवर्तन्ते नारायणे प्रलीयन्ते This is very beautiful. What was this chant about? Well, I meditated on your questions and topics, and I thought that we will begin this with the chant that is chant about how life begins, so that we start with that for this topic. And towards the end, we will do the last part of this same chant that talks about what ha what is happening when we are so-called dying. So there is this last part of this chant of this Upanishad that talks about the last moment in our life and that is what we will do towards the end. Wow, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Very beautiful, very, very, very soothing. I felt it very soothing. It's also nice. one of the favorite chants of my father and my grandfather. Mm, yes. Okay, good. Great. Yeah. So, um, what are your thoughts, Kaustup, about our relationship to death and dying these days in modern times? We think we are so technologically advanced or that the science is so advanced, but at the same time, we don't know how to explain some very, very common and inevitable things as death and dying. So. What, how is our relationship? What do you think? I think in modern uh, society we have um, <clears throat> an inappropriate relationship uh, with everything almost, not only death, but also with nature, with people, and uh, also <clears throat> with uh, money and things like that. <clears throat> so. The reason for that is unknown. I think it's because our priorities are wrong. But somehow it's true that we don't value life and death, um, the gift of life and perhaps the gift of death as much as perhaps we value things like money, ego-based structures like money and power. And uh, recently that is what uh, I came to the realization and I told one of my students this comment that 
we value money more than our life. And that's, I said, uh, the only way to realize that life is more precious than money is just take any currency in any country, even if it's just one dollar or one rupee, and stack up hundred of them and count one by one, holding your breath and see if your breath can last till you count hundred notes. I'm guaranteeing you it won't. So you will realize very soon what is more important, which is basically life. And uh, <clears throat> I think this is precisely why we have a very inappropriate relationship with that because somehow we think we are indisposable in this form, in this journey of life. <clears throat> and that's the ego that has become very strong. And uh, that is why our relationship with life and that is somehow very confused. We are not valuing the concept of life and the concept of death with the respect and dignity that they deserve. And death is looked at as an ending rather than looked at as somehow a milestone towards either a next cycle of life or towards liberation, not necessarily an ending. It's an ending of the ego, ego-based structure, <clears throat> but it's not necessarily the end. And uh, that is what I feel is the reason why we have a very inappropriate relationship with death, because we look at it as something that we are going to lose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than look at it as something that is uh, either a liberation or a transitionary point mm -hmm. toward the next journey. And I think that is what is the big problem in modern society. So it looks like uh, not that we just lost the connection to, uh, to death and have a, a good and appropriate relationship to it and understanding, we actually lost the connection to life also, to our life. And uh, uh, maybe we can reflect a little bit of breathing. So when we breathe in, it's life. When we breathe out, it could be like how uh -huh, we are dying. And we are lost uh, also the connection uh, with our breathing. So uh, lost, we lost a connection about everything about that. Uh, you could say that, yes. In a Vedic culture, in the Chandogya Upanishad, they talk about how life is created in the moment when we are conceived, even before we take the form of a material structure, of material seed. Uh -huh. Our consciousness is manifested already by the divine through the inhalation of the divine prana, of the divine, while reciting the pranava mantra. <clears throat> so when the divine is chanting the mantra Om, the consciousness is created and in that instant, the consciousness is integrated into the matter, the, what we call the, the seed of, that comes from the mother and the father, where there is the matter that takes the structure to hold the consciousness. And all this is happening when the divine is reciting a mantra while the divine is inhaling. And if you look at the moment we are dying, exhalation is the last breath. And that's why my grandfather <clears throat> always defined life as the span between the first inhale and the last exhale. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that is why we also have a fear of death because we as a human society, we are takers, not givers. And somehow we associate exhalation with giving. We are giving wow. our breath away. So subconsciously, we don't want to give something away. We want to take just look at how much we are taking from nature and how little we are giving back. And the same with people. We want to take from people whatever we can, 
But when it comes to giving people, we have a lot of resistance and hesitation. So that's partially also maybe the reason why we have a very difficult relationship with the exhalation and therefore the death itself, because death happens through the final exhale. And it's an act of giving and uh, we don't want to give. We want to hold on and continue. And that is because every conscious being once has the wish to be eternal. Patanjali talks about this in the fourth chapter, 10th aphorism. Tasam anaditvancha ashisho nityatva. Every sentient being has the deep wish to be permanent. Now, it's impossible because there is two structures that are functioning together in our system. One, which is the consciousness and the other, which is the matter, the body and the mind. Now, the problem is one is more permanent than the other. The consciousness is much more everlasting or much more, uh, what do you call, has a longer lifespan than the material body. So it's not possible for the consciousness to remain in this body for if, forever. But there's a deep wish for various philosophical reasons. There is a deep wish to remain forever. And that's why we struggle with this concept of dying, because there is a deep conflict between wanting to be permanent and a realization that we are not permanent. At some point, we have to die. This body has to die. So when we identify ourselves through the material body so strongly, this creates great challenge about the connection to death as well. So we want to stay permanent in this body. That's the wish because there's philosophical reasons as well. Partially, it's also convenience because we don't have to learn the patterns to live this life again and again. So partially it's practical and partially it's also because of ignorance because we think that we are just this body and so we develop strong attachments to that. Yes. So uh, uh, what do you think, for example, uh, I'm very interested in all these ancient uh, practices, also, for example, some shamanic practices. Also here I am in Slovenia, so we have these Slavic ancient practices of goddess, fierce goddess, yeah? that were uh, that were uh, uh, present in the ancient times here and also you have all the goddesses and goddesses like i don't know thousands and um looks like for me as a therapist that in these ancient times people were observing nature and of course stars and universe and then they could connect it, this to the uh, our subconscious and have all these rituals, uh, uh, God, gods and goddesses, and connecting to ancestors, and in one and and this means that they were even more connected to subconscious that we are now. And as a therapist, I could say that they were even more advanced than we are now. Uh, there is no doubt about it. We are. We can call ourselves modern but we are definitely not spiritually more developed. We may be yeah. technologically different. I don't even want to say we are advanced in technology yeah. because I don't think any architect of today's time would be able to build something like the pyramids, which will last the next 5,000 years. So we are not even advanced even in this kind of technology. But one of the key differences between the ancient um, ancestors that we all had and us in the modern era is that they lived in accordance with the laws of nature. They connected to the laws of nature. They observed 
the seasons very well. They were very locally dependent. They were not globally dependent like many of us. And it's fascinating because just look at what the coronavirus has done. It has taken globalization to its knees and brought us all back to localization. I cannot travel even outside of my city now and even the shopping for vegetables and fruits that I need on a daily basis. I'm only allowed to buy from the local shop. I can't even go to any shop that I want. Mm -hmm. So in some way we have become local. So the ancient people were living very much in accordance with the laws of nature and they observed how nature functioned that it's like a cycle of birth and death and birth and death because we just start changing the form of matter but consciousness takes different bodies and different uh, uh, technologies uh, to fulfill its dharma sometimes we are born as a human sometimes maybe as a bird sometimes maybe as a tree and that's why they talked about this body take body is just a vehicle for the consciousness to fulfill its mission in life and this is the realization that i had to one of the questions that you were uh, proposed about what is death mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking about this the whole last couple of days. And uh, like I said, uh, I have also been spending the last 10 days working very deeply in the translation of my father's Yoga Sutra work. And uh, as the saying goes, you have to sleep on some ideas. So this afternoon when I was having my usual nap, I was thinking, Oh my God, Katya has asked such a difficult question. What am I going to answer about what is that? Somehow I slept off and when I wake up in my sleep, I think the revelation arised, which also Patanjali talks about, Swapnanidra Jnana Alambanam When I wake up, suddenly I had the Sutra, third chapter 35, which is one of the most fascinating sutras from many points of view. Sattva purusha yoho atyanta sankirna yoho pratyaya vishesho bhogaha parartatva svartha samyamat purusha jnanam. Basically what Patanjali is saying is that basically the matter, the body and mind and senses that we are inheriting is for the sake of serving the purusha and the purusha is manifested for serving and fulfilling a dharma now for example my dharma is that to transmit the teachings of my ancestors to the world this is my dharma so that is the dharma of my consciousness and my body and the senses must be utilized mainly for uh, fulfilling this dharma. And of course, as part of this, I also experience life. It's like when you take a plane to go from Chennai to Frankfurt, the goal of the plane is that it's a vehicle of transportation for me to go from my town to Frankfurt where I meet my dear Sabine, our friend. And uh, I'm not just taking the flight. There's also entertainment on the flight, in-screen in entertainment, like every seat has a TV where I can watch some movies like James Bond movies or something else that I like. So I see that and then I arrive at my destination, my dharma is fulfilled. The same way this body is given as a vehicle. So this body is the Lufthansa aircraft for the consciousness to fulfill its dharma. And as part of that journey, we experience life as the in-flight in entertainment. However, however, what the ego does, parartatvat, it changes the function. So what happens is that the consciousness 
starts to become the slave of the body and the senses and the body and the senses start to become the slave of the objects of this world so both of them are not doing their own swartha their own dharma they are doing something else parartha that's what the sutra says and that is death death is killing of our true potential and wasting energy on something else if we who are given this energy or do we are wasting the energy on something else then we are basically killing our potential like if for example i have a set of water for my garden but instead of watering my garden that is why i'm given this water i start washing the car then my plants are dying the same way if the prana the energy which is a metaphor of water is been given to us to fulfill our dharma but we are so busy in using this energy to nourish the ego to nourish all immaterial things all things that are not our dharma and priority we are basically spiritually dead this is what i feel is death and that's why i say we are not living our potential we are basically dead yes i have the same feeling about it this is why i i am a therapist for gifted people but not just gifted in in the logic way but also spiritually gifted so uh i think it's very important and it's the only way to lift us on in a more uh, spiritual society and more ethical society a society that is connecting to our subconscious yeah exactly and and i'm very glad that you are helping all these gifted people and i know some people from our audience are also helping gifted people but the question of priority is the most fascinating thing because if you think about it if you look at the situation right now with the corona virus the crisis what are we rushing to buy or to to need we need food we need medical supplies and we need medical help like nurses and care providers and things like that we are not rushing to buy cars we are not rushing to buy houses we are not rushing to buy expensive handbags that's basically why our society is so wrong because we have given those kind of things such high priority in our life when they don't deserve that priority and we have forgotten all the most simple and important things that actually are so important for self sustenance if you look at the lowest paid people they are the care providers they are the nurses they are the cleaners they are the farmers but those are the people who we need now most and therefore the priority has to change yes and i i hope i hope we could uh, uh, see this in the future and that the uh, uh, coronavirus with a little with a little help of coronavirus as we can say it maybe like this yeah but i think i want to refer to a, a question one question to your previous answer i it might be that some people are here that don't know actually and what is dharma or how to know dharma this is the, the question what is my dharma because if we would know then we would go there yeah <laughs> uh, dharma is basically the life purpose for which we are taking this form in most traditional systems when we look at not just vedic culture but also whether it's buddhist culture or the pagan culture from native traditions in australia and new zealand in south america and africa etc they are very clear that each of us in this world are born for a purpose 
to accomplish in our life and that's why we are given even that kind of a body that kind of a mind because think about it i gave you the metaphor of a plane journey to frankfurt now if my destination is frankfurt i need to take a plane whereas if my destination is somewhere to my next village in i need to take a car or a motorbike so the vehicle is chosen based on the journey and the destination we are supposed to reach the same way because of the destination that we are meant to reach by fulfilling our dharma we are given this particular kind of body mind senses etc so that it helps us fulfill that purpose so that's what i call dharma dharma is a life purpose it's not a job a job helps you pay your bills but dharma is not just to pay your bills dharma is that you express your full potential because that's what you are meant to do you take a flower it's blossoming because not because somebody is appreciating it or somebody is paying some money to buy it but because that is its inherent true nature and potential that is what is dharma we have to express our inherent potential and not be restricted by pressures of society or pressures of what other people want from us or expect from us or our fears our insecurities it's not meant to be the obstacle and in most traditional philosophies you are not going to find liberation until you have expressed your true potential when you look at a fruit or a flower it drops on it it's liberating itself from the plant only when it has fulfilled its potential not before not I mean i'm not talking about somebody external cutting it that's different but it's naturally liberating itself only when it has fulfilled its dharma so without fulfilling that potential there's no liberation so we can't really com uh, complain about life saying oh i can't do that i can't be myself you can you just don't want to and that's where the life purpose has to take precedence and priority and not what others or even our own fears want us to be this is the part when you talked before about ego that it's uh, a little bit uh, that it's different not a little bit but that it's differently connected and it has different function it goes into the function of ego not of the seeds so yes. how, how how can we change the wires um, that is where um, i only know about how yoga is able to help because i'm only a yoga teacher and what i have seen in my own life experience is that when we practice what patanjali is presenting called the ashtanga yoga where there are certain changes in our lifestyle certain changes in our attitudes certain practices for the body certain practices engaging the breath etc certain practices engaging the mind we are somehow liberating ourselves from pre-fixed patterns and in my personal experience what has been the most powerful method is mantra practice which is changing the vibrations in the body because in vedic philosophy matter comes from vibration and if you want to change matter the best way to do it is by changing vibrations of the matter so in vedic science we use what is called mantras perhaps in modern societies you can use mantras or chants from your own traditions or positive affirmations but also work with changes in lifestyle changes in attitudes reflection of what is our priority and sometimes these are difficult to make by our own effort because we get stuck in patterns and that's where we need some guides and some coaches like you are 
doing for some of your gifted students. I am doing it for some of my students and my teachers have done that for me. We need some guidance who are acting like a mirror, not to tell us what to do, but to help us identify who we are and what is our true potential. A good teacher is like a mirror who is allowing the student to see their own true potential and encouraging them to be in their true potential, not trying to do something because you want them to do that or somebody else wants them to do that or because you just want to earn some money. That's our job as a teacher to act like a mirror and a good teacher always functions like that. So we need to do this not alone, but with the help of some guidance. But at the same time, we have to take responsibility to look in the mirror, which means we have to start doing some contemplation and reflection. And most importantly, the third is the most important thing, which is to start taking some action. No change will happen Mm -hmm. unless we want to act and we start acting. Wanting to act is not enough. Just because I want to help my neighbor, it doesn't mean that I am helping my neighbor. So I have to actually act to change my patterns. And that is the important things. And here, I always remember a quote from Albert Einstein who always said, insanity is repeating the same thing, expecting different consequences. We can do that. We have to change. Exactly, yeah. So this, as I, as I hear you, is that there is a will or some sort of sparkle inside still left that can pull us to this uh, spiritual quest and uh, that we are active that we say okay we go to uh, uh, to do yoga to, we go to yoga therapist we go to therapist of course we uh, I, I I find it that all the people that are uh, going on this uh, quest it, it is a hero quest but nevertheless it's always very uh, uh, rewarding yeah yes in in, uh, in my belief, and I have seen this through some wonderful examples in my students, it's never too late to change. Mm -hmm. I have some students who are in their 80s when they have waken up and said, I want to change. It's never too late. And the only thing that, there are two things that prevent us from this change. One is basically fear and the other is laziness. And both can be overcome. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I would like to ask every one of you if you have any question from, for Kaustup. Uh, just put it in the comments. We will read it. Kaustup will read it. Uh, so you're welcome to ask question. You have now Dr. Kaustup Desikachar here, a spiritual mentor, a spiritual advisor, and he's uh, answering the questions about death and dying. Uh, so my next question comes to be, so if we are already all death, that death in the earth, because we are not on our spiritual path, let's say it like this, yeah, uh, we still have uh, some sort of uh, uh, way out. So we connect to our uh, uh, spiritual path, to our subconscious. For me, this is all in, in the same package. For me, as long as the consciousness is living in this body, mm -hmm. there is hope. Because that light is enough, a little light is enough mm -hmm. to somehow light up the darkness. And this is where I'm so grateful for this time because I am reviewing my studies with my father and there is one sutra that uh, I was recently translating where 
the metaphor that was taught to me by my father based on the commentary of Vyasa is that when you place a lamp in a small cup or a small pot, it illuminates that pot. But when you place the same lamp in a room that is bigger, it illuminates the whole room. And when you place that light in a big palace, the light illuminates the whole palace. We only need a spark of light. Its power is enormous. We don't need a big light. We can't handle a big light. We can't look at the sun for too long. So a little spark of light is enough. That's why this translation is so helpful for me because in the sutra, Vishoka va Jyotishmati. Patanjali is saying all we need to focus on is a little spark of light in our heart and that's enough. And that is how we also know our dharma. Some people ask the question, how do we know our dharma? Very simple. Lack, lack of knowing dharma is called as ignorance or darkness. The same metaphor. Now, if you go to a dark room, you can't see what is the contents of the room. So what do you do? You turn on the light either by a switch if you are a modern guy or, or if you are a traditional person, you would take a little lamp to the room and the whole room will be illuminated. The moment there is illumination of the room, you know what are the contents of the room. The same way, the moment we start connecting with the light in our heart, it will illuminate who we are and what is our true potential. But if we live in the darkness of the head, of the brain, too much thinking, too much analysis, we are not going to see the contents of the room. That's why Dharma is not known through intellectual exercise. It's known through a feeling, an intuition from the heart. It's not an analysis. So that's also answering one of the questions that somebody has asked, how does one know his or her Dharma? And another person has asked, what's the difference between Dharma and Marga? Very simple. Dharma and Marga are like together. You are moving on the path of your Dharma. The path is the Marga. The Dharma is the movement in that path. And they cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, maybe just a, an explanation about Dharma, because maybe for some people it's the first time that they, they ever heard yeah, this term is, uh, uh, as you said, it's uh, something that you not uh, intellectually just get it. Ah, this is my job. For me, exam for example, I was before in very like big uh, uh, jobs uh, and uh, uh, and workplaces, and I was n I never thought there will be a, a, a therapist, but now uh, when I am in in uh, doing my own therapy, uh, also with youth counselors or with some other my supervision visors, or uh, doing the therapy with my clients. It's so fulfilling. I can see the energy moving and can feel the subconscious is reflecting and speaking to me and to the clients back. Uh, and uh, uh, it's something that it's very natural also to me. It's very natural. That's a very good point because if since you talk about yourself, when you look at your own uh, self a few years ago, uh, you were very intellectual. You were thinking a lot. You were analyzing. I still am. Yeah. I'm still. <laughs> but somehow, the practices that you were given, you were offered, not only by me, but also some others who you were consulting, somehow brought you closer to your heart and to your feelings. And when we do that, then we start to express nobody needs to tell us what is our dharma or what should we do it will flow naturally that's why it's called dharma dharati iti dharma that which is inherent in us we just have to be ourselves it will flow naturally in english there is 
a phrase. It's called being in your element. So you just start to become more and more in your true nature. You are in your element. Now, whether somebody else agrees to it or not, somebody else understands it or not, that's none of our business because we will not understand why they are the way they are. It's very important to realize they cannot understand the way we are. So it's so important for us to find this natural tendency and potential and express it in the best possible way. So in some way, dharma is what is natural to us. What well, feels natural, yeah, exactly. And uh, um, the fear and the ignorance and the ego are, in a way, if I can uh, reflect what you said, the the terrifying archety archetype of the death with the blade that we have in our culture. Actually, it's already all the time with us there, present. Yes, yes. I understand, but that's. That's why I said that is connected to a sense yeah. of loss. But death is not necessarily a loss. It's only a transitionary point for the next journey. Yes. Let's check uh, the questions. Did we answer everything, Kaustup? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the co-host and, and the teacher. Thank Maria for being here. And Maria is also say, saying that writing yoga helps to build understanding of this moment. Also, the spirituality of your local Indian society have a very strong roots. Yes, very good point, Maria. This is why uh, also my my question, Kaustup. I, I know it, it can be provocative sometimes, all these questions, but I know you, you, you are able to answer. This is why I put in all these questions. So we have a lot, for example, Indian, uh, uh, Indian has a lot of gods and goddesses and vehicles and, and uh, tools. There is such a profound uh, uh, energy elements, archetypes in the subconscious and your all uh, culture there and also for example here uh, uh, in uh, my region here the slavic uh, uh, pa pagan uh, uh, history or shamanic history you know so and we know uh, that a lot of people are talking about angels and there are also ghosts around us there's so many things besides human beings but in one meditation, I had an information that I have to ask you. What if all of this does not exist? What if there is no God? Well, <clears throat> the, the concept of nothing and uh, everything, the concept of emptiness and wholeness is inseparable so if you say there is no god it's basically the opposite side of there is god and if you say that there is god it's the opposite of that there is no god i'm a photographer you can't develop a positive picture of a, of a photo without the negative it's the same case whether there is a god or a no god that's not the most important question. The more important question is, what do we do with our life that we have been given for a particular purpose? That's all. And God is just a name given to a universal consciousness and that exists. We all know that. That exists. We can feel that sometimes we are guided. And of course there are ghosts and angels and spirits that are guiding us or sometimes not uh, necessarily being very friendly uh, but it's their journey because imagine every consciousness that has not yet fulfilled its journey it's hanging on for the next plane to catch 
Now my journey is not is to Frankfurt, but let's say Lufthansa is not functioning, but only Emirates is functioning and I go, I have to transit in Dubai. What do I do in Dubai? I'm waiting there for a few hours to catch the next plane to go to Frankfurt. The same way, sometimes the consciousness is hanging around to catch the next plane, which is the next body to fulfill its dharma. And that's why the concept of spirits and ghosts are not things that we have to be afraid of. And the problem is we all get stuck in an identity and even the concept of God in a particular religion or a particular form could become an egoistic identity. Because if I say I'm a Hindu, that becomes my ego. I'm not necessarily a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim. I'm just trying to become a better person. That's all. And so if that's the danger as well is we start the ego is so smart that it starts to bring its identity even to the field of spirituality. And that's why we need to be so careful. Yes, this is very important. Yeah, uh, very important to, to have a, a, a very strong sense. And of course, to have someone to reflect, as you said before, a therapist. Uh, we have here a question from Sylvia that I also wanted to ask you is, how uh, can we help someone who is dying or how can we prepare somehow ourselves to that? How can we do uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, chants maybe or mantras for someone who is dying, like a family member, as Sylvia is asking, or also for ourselves? I think the connection to family is much more stronger for two reasons. It's not only because of attachment uh, from a perspective of uh, association, because we spend a lot of time with family, we grew up with our family and things like that, but also it's blood. Blood is one of the very powerful substances in our body that carries consciousness. That's why blood goes to every part of the human body. There is no part of the human body where the blood does not go. The bile fluid does not go everywhere. The urine does not go everywhere, but the blood goes everywhere. That's because that's the carrier of the consciousness. So in some way, that makes it more stronger uh, because um, the attachment is stronger. That's why the word rakta is used for the blood, rakta, raga, desire, attachment. They're all very connected words. Um, so when a, a person in our family dies, we all think that they are gone. They are not gone. They exist in us, in our blood, just like we will exist in others, in our successors or successive generations, which need not be our own children. It could also be our brothers, children, our sisters, children, our cousins, children, because bloodline is very strong. So we are not losing them completely. We are only losing a particular form of them. And what we need to do is, that's why every ancient tradition builds some rituals around death to honor the departed for their next journey. So that's why if you look at many traditional systems, they're always packing them with things that they think is needed for the next journey. And I think if we can engage in some kind of ritual like that in our own way, if we are not following any religion or any cultural point of view, but to say a proper goodbye, to say thanks for their guidance and to say thanks for the inheritance that we have had from us and then let them go to their next journey, that's the, that's the best way to let go of uh, a family member or anybody else for that matter, who we are attached to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about uh, like preparing uh, uh, for death? 
uh, our own death, our transition? Do you have any recommendation for that? Um, my grandfather always said that yoga is the process of delaying our daily death. Because from the moment we are born, we are every day, we are one day further away from our birth, one day closer to our death. So the best way to prepare for that is by coming to terms with the fact that eventually we are going to go at some point and honor the time that we have been given for this life by being grateful and most importantly by using this time in the best way to fulfill our dharma if we are wasting time and not fulfilling our dharma then we are essentially not honoring our life or our death because that will lead us to a death with regret whereas if we have honored our time we will have a death with grace and with dignity and i can only say that about my own experience with my father's death how he was preparing himself and he knew that he had done his duty and he had done his dharma and his last gesture when he took his last breath his hands came together he had really no energy to move um, any of his body parts in the last days of his death but he was conserving his last energy to do that which is most important which is to bring his hands together to say thank you and grace for what he had been given and i think that was a big lesson for me and the realization that we have been given this life for a good purpose let us use it honorably that's the best preparation for death because we can't predict when death will come great yeah thank you very much this was very graceful also to hear so uh um i think we will uh, slowly end it's one hour already uh and i can see and read here there's a lot of question about dharma and how to for example kimberly is asking on behalf of diana um the best uh, the best tools of yoga to help uh, discover dharma and uh, because we are slowly now ending this uh, interview Kausu will also chant now also so stay uh, for the chant also I think Kausu I will going to invite you now in front of others for you, our third interview about dharma I think it's very important for people to understand more and to have maybe some more practical solution yeah that could be the topic itself for another interview maybe even yeah. two weeks or one week or two weeks we can plan that yeah i think this is a great idea what do you think guys here i, I i'm sure you agree that council can, can can talk about this for us and uh, give us some uh, practical advices of a very profound knowledge that he has so uh thank you oh linda thank you valerie uh, Rone um thank you all guys that you were here with us um i didn't greet you all but uh by name by name by each uh, name but i greet you all also you also i know uh yeah namaste dear friends Kausu will now chant and with the chant we will end up uh this interview uh, please do uh, share the interview because you, by that you are sharing life and love and very, very nice to connect uh, all of you with uh, Kaustup and me on this interview. Thank you very much, Kaustup. You are always, as always, uh, uh, so interesting to listen to you and also uh, very, very deep. It helped also me personally a lot and uh, please chant us the, the final chant for us yes i chant this this part is talking about the final journey where once we are 
completely uh, fulfilled our dharma, we are integrating and merging ourselves with the divine consciousness. And it's also very special for me because it, it is the last chant that my father heard before he died. So I'm sure through this chant, he also is participating now in this interview. Om Pratyagānandam Brahma Purusham Pranavasvarupam Akāra Okara Makara Eti Tani Kadha Sama Bharata Eta Do Eti Yamotva Muchate Yogi Janma Samsara Bandhana Om Namo Narayana Yete Mantro Pasakaha Vai kuntha bhuvana lokanga meshyate Tadidam param pundarekam vegnyana ghanam Tasmat tadidavan matra Brahmanyo Devaki Putro Brahmanyo Madho Sudano Om Sarva Bhotas Karana Rupa Makara Parabram Hom Etad Atharva Shiroyo Adhete Prataradhe Yano Aratri Kritam Papanashayate Sāyamadhe yāno ādhevasa kṛtam pāpanna śayate Mādhyandena mādhitya bhimuko dhiyāna Pancha pātako papātakāt pramuchyate Sarva Veda Parayana Punyalabhati Narayana Sayujyamavapnoti Shri Mannarayana Sayujyamavapnoti Ya Evam Vedam Etyopanishat Hare Om 
Shante 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 Namaste friends. Namaste.